Yama everyone. Tonight I'm coming to you from Mongol country, over which Mongol elders and ancestors never ceded sovereignty. National Young Writers Festival this year takes place on the countries of a number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nations. And it's worthwhile to take a moment now to acknowledge the country that you're on and your relationship to the mobs over whom they hold sovereignty. Welcome to Lucky Country at National Young Writers Festival. Australia's arc through the last few hundred years of history continues to be one of colonisation, enforced assimilation and erasure. Here, three writers discuss the ongoing work of black and migrant activists to resist, reclaim and reinvigorate and how those distinct groups of activists can best work together. And it brings me great pleasure to be introducing uh, some of those writers here today. Uh, Jazz Money is a poet, educator, and digital producer of Wiradjuri Heritage. She's the 2020 recipient of the David Uniathan Prize for her manuscript, The Place Between the Paperbark, which will be published by UQP in 2021. Jazz is grateful to live on the sovereign lands of the Gundagara and Darug nations. Born in Anawak, but currently living in Wantwa, Victoria speaks to her history as a refugee and migrant across two Western countries. Her experience of forced removal, street violence and settler privileges have shaped her critique of power systems using the neo-Zapatista neo framework as her foundation. She is passionate about decolonization through language, memory revitalization, food, healing practices and truth telling. Most importantly, as a settler in so-called Australia, she stands in solidarity with the unique struggles and resistance of First Nations people and considers herself a student with a long way to go. And of course, the third writer is me, um, Alison Whitaker, and I'm a Gomorrah woman and a writer. Um, before we get any further, I wanted to take the opportunity to ask you, Victoria and Jazz, where are you today? On whose country? Um, I'm at home on the beautiful sovereign lands of the Darug and Gundangara and um, pay my respects to elders past and present and extend that acknowledgement and respect to all the custodians across the many nations that make up this continent because this is a digital event and we exist across all those places where this broadcast can reach, um, which mm -hmm. is a huge honour and privilege to get to sort of digitally trend send that uh that space so thank you for that beautiful um welcome or oh, welcoming to us an acknowledgement of country Alison. <laughs> thank and just you. Know, yeah i second that says in this that is taking place digitally um so wherever we are i would encourage everybody to reflect on who's land down <clears throat> and myself i'm speaking to everyone today from Aranja country which is in the Northern Territory. Its colonial name is Alice Springs, and I pay my respects to the elders, past, present, and emerging, and current, and the ones that exist beyond time as well. Mm. I appreciate I didn't actually put this in our schedule of questions, so it might actually be a little bit of a curveball, and we can completely cut it out if this goes haywire. Um, but I thought it would be an interesting starting point to talk to you both about how you define um, something that we maybe call so-called Australia and how do you define your relationship with this entity that is quite abstract that we call Australia. Who's going to go? <laughs> <laughs> maybe we I can know, it's a really hard question first. to start with. <laughs> um. Um, I, well, um, like my relationship to Australia um, and the many nations that make up this continent, I think is one that I feel like really there's a lot of tension with, um, which I'm okay with. I'm, like I'm okay to live with that tension, but it's like there's nothing I love more than this land, but also the way in which it is governed and run by, like, the colonial invasion, nothing breaks my heart more. And, like, to kind of live in that constant state of grief 
and love is something that I like, you know, some days is totally exhausting and some days totally like invigorating and and I feel like it's a complex like it's a bad it's a bad relationship like you would tell your friend to break up with that person but also it's a good relationship (laughs) and one like that I'm committed to (laughs) Um, my relationship with the so-called country I guess I see a lot of parallels across the three different places I've spent significant amounts of time now. There's my home Mm. country that was colonized 501 years ago. Um, So-called Canada is the colonial country as well. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I think they just celebrated around. Oh, my God, I can't believe I used that word. I'm thinking of all the advertisements that they said on my Facebook, the government ones. They're like, celebrate Canada 150, a.k.a. Canada genocide, and don't celebrate that shit. Um, so sorry, but um, <laughs> I don't know why I use that word. But so it's about 150 years there, and about 250 years here. I am really bad with memory numbers, but I think what you mentioned, Jazz, about grief is so outstanding across all three nations. And I think. I've never lived in other colonial countries, but definitely would imagine the similar grief across all places that have been colonized mm-hmm. and the complexities of how that colonization took place because in each place, people were unique and the colonization was unique to that place. So while there's so many similarities that we connect on as colonized peoples, there's also so much homogenization of our stories. And I think it's I mean, here there's so many different nations in this continent and that gets kind of labeled as one experience. And also for Mexico, there used to be 120 different language groups and that gets homogenized into one First Nations experience when there are so many different experiences of how colonization took place and how it gets embedded within our nervous system and with our spirits and through our bodies too. Um, And so I find it really complicated because there's that, Solidarity and pride, speaking from my own country, of all of us who are mestizo or First Nations or identify as Indigenous because Mexico is quite complex, um, that I want to feel that solidarity, but also there's so much fracture that sometimes do we then underrepresent ourselves by not homogenizing and banding together against this colonial system. Yeah, it's kind of hard to grapple with sometimes, like which way of existing is right on the date, and I feel like it changes so much. And it's mm-hmm. tiring. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like um, you've both thought, thought really critically about the, the conception of, like, the nation state and how it relates to, to you and how um, First Nations lives are kind of governed by this construct that's come onto land. Mm-hmm. So would it be accurate to say that there's a distinction between um, this continent for you and this idea of Australia? Yeah, 100%. Um, I would say the land, similar to what Jazz said, of having so much love for the land, um, but so much hate for the colonial structures that are imposed upon the land. I definitely spend time in nature and feel so, because I can't really go back home to live. Um, I don't know if I'll ever feel able to go back home safely. Mm-hmm. And so I feel so welcomed here. And when I'm out in nature, I am so thankful for being received on this land so gently and with so much love. And what an honor it is to walk here. But I hate the fact that my visa applications were not from a from First Nations people themselves. They were by a bunch of white dudes at immigration. There's no connection to my or any of that, let alone all the other isms that exist with me. Mm. Um, Jay, I might turn to you now. Oh, sorry, unless you had something else to say. Yeah, I was going to say, what's what? How do you frame it, Alison? Like what? So your distinction between those spaces? Yeah, I mean, um, so in my spare time, I'm also, uh, uh, in my spare time, in my day job, I'm a lawyer when I'm not wearing my writer's hat. Um, and so with legal history, it's really easy to think of Australia as like this kind of concepts or architecture of power that kind of turned up here um, and is asserting something over the land, which is quite distinct from 
sometimes when I use Australia as a shorthand to refer to the continent. Um, and other other mobs, I'm thinking, for instance, Aotearoa, which some people might know as New Zealand, um, we don't really have an equivalent shared name there. So there's an awkwardness for us and a concern sometimes that these concepts just collapse into one another. Um, so sometimes it's helpful to sort it out, um, especially when we're thinking about, I suppose, our writing, um, which I think this might segue nicely into the next question. I feel like we are right, always writing to this concept of Australia or talking back or pushing back on it. Um, but what does it mean for you two as authors, as writers, um, and as full people outside of what you put on the page? Um, what does it mean to talk back to this concept of Australia that you have? Um, okay, I'll... I'll pick that one. <laughs> um, uh, I I think like I can't help but talk back to Australia because it's the thing that I'm so obsessed with um, as like someone who, you know, as an Indigenous person of this place who is like I live off country, off my own country, but but I am so fortunate to live on beautiful country that has had custodians since, you know, the first sunrise. And I I feel like every time I don't write towards this place, I'm still writing on this place or for this place or from this place inevitably. Um, so it sort of, like we were saying before, it sort of sits between that tension of like, love and grief and celebration and resistance, which I guess is a nice segue back to the description of this event. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> yeah. um, for me, I guess, I wonder when I talk back to Australia as the colonial construct of Australia, um, I always question where I position myself and what's the best use of my voice and I I think that it's I can critique a lot of the powers but also I need to keep in mind that I'm speaking very slowly and pausing so I'm thinking on the go but it's complicated because I feel like at times in my experience back home when others speak and critique something that doesn't systematically target you first or at the most, um, you can be putting those people who it does target in danger. And I'm just really mindful of that, of that if myself as a non-First Nations person to this continent speak to this, and if my voice on critique then gives anger to that system to then hurt the people that I'm meant to be in solidarity with then actually my voice is not useful and I really need to be checking myself in what's the best use of my voice and how can I use my voice as a platform rather than center stage mm -hmm. yeah and I'm very I try to be as mindful of that mm -hmm. So it sounds like at the, the core of both of your writing back to this concept of Australia as you think of it, at the centre is relationships and responsibility. Is that fair of me to say? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And care, yeah. caring for each other. Yeah, yeah, care and community are really like how, like I feel like writing brings me into that space even though it's a solitary mm -hmm. act. There is a there is an exchange that goes on that um, I'm so grateful for. Mm. Um, in a, I guess, um, how do you put that uh, ethic of care or that responsibility in your writing into action? What does that look like when you're putting words onto the page to demonstrate that care that you talked about, Victoria, or to think, Jazz, about what it means to write off country? Um, for me, I tried to, I tried to put my care through by writing about not just the despair that happens across globally from all the isms, capitalism, neoliberal imperialism, colonialism, patriarchy, and I tried to weave in 
the truth of the experiences of struggle, but also celebrate the joy and the resistance and the brilliance and not because we're surviving or that we have even resilience I straddle with sometimes because I feel like there's so much more to us than just resisting the system. And I feel mm. like there is so much laughter and joy and care that gets missed and or gets seen as, wow, they're so strong. Um, <laughs> when actually, like, can we just be happy and normal? And can that normalize, normal life be celebrated for just living? And so mm. I'm trying to incorporate a bit more of that into my writing and just the micro celebrations of the everyday while also still holding critique of the power systems and then trying to learn how to balance that as a form of care to the people around me and people I stand alongside. Yeah, I love that, Victoria. Like laughter and love as protest is um mm. something that is so like incredible about I mean, First Nations communities that I, I won't speak for, like, others, but um, something that's so strong in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community is just mm -hmm. the way that, like, um, oh, that's the thing, one of the things that I love, just the way that, you know, mm -hmm. our, our, our laughter and our success is is protest. Um, and, like, you, so many brilliant writers write, like, really passionate protest poetry and activism poetry and sort of reclaim various histories through their writing and that's something that I enjoy doing but also and, and have the privilege of, like, writing in that space but also not always having that pressure like you talk about is really, um, mm -hmm. is really important. Um, it reminds me of a poem of yours, Alison, that I really love, which is... Uh, is it called BPM, which is like this gorgeous celebration of just like all forms of blackness? Yeah, I wish I had it on me. I asked, was asked for a reading once. Um, so the poem's structured around um, different headings of beats per minute and the idea was it was structured around a heartbeat, uh, which is nice on the page, but I was asked to perform it and I actually can't read music and I have no idea what beats per minute means. Um, so it was a bit of a flop, but um, just these escalating kinds of um, messiness in the way that we relate to one another um, mm -hmm. and the, the beauty of having an interdependent community was for me really, really important to represent as a, a joyous thing rather than um, as a, a burden, I guess, or an mm -hmm. obligation that does run mm -hmm. by it. Yeah. Um, so I might just take it back to the event description so people kind of know that we're doing what it says on the box. Um, but what do you think your writing can do, as the event text says, to resist the colony, to resist this construction of um, Australia or Mexico or Canada? I, I want to write things that tug at the facade of it this place and this colony um and I feel like the writing that I do that I think does something is things that sort of pick at the surface of Australia and and that might be to like point at the sort of fallacies of the space mm -hmm. or the context or the way that like cause and and form are sort of remembered in the way that white history and and the white narrative exists on in this place um mm. but my writing doesn't always do that either <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's what I think like outside of being a writer but also as a reader that's the stuff that I love to read um mm. things that sort of are able to challenge the way that we perceive our reality in like exciting new ways because there's a lot to be challenged. Mm. And I, 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 one thing that I love that First Nations writers and you know across this continent do is like using their own languages that are so much more interesting and rich than anything the colonial tongue can give us. And, um, I, I love seeing people celebrating celebrating what is true about, you know, this place and these many countries. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know about what it does because I feel like that's maybe more up to the reader 
Um, and I don't know how people interpret it. I can speak into what it does for me and the healing I get when I work through things. But in terms of what it does and an effect outside of me, um, I have no idea if it even affects sometimes. But um, and what I hope to achieve with it, a bit of what I touched to is maybe provide alternative storylines that are written by us and for us. Mm. And so sometimes I'm writing for my community, sometimes I'm writing for communities I'm in solidarity with both, and other times I'm writing to the oppressive audiences or the audiences who engage in oppression, audiences who, who wittingly engage in it. And I feel like those are two very different poems mm. um, or pieces of writing. I mainly write poetry. And I feel like if I'm writing to each other um, across solidarity of being BIPOC, I would have it can be so varied. It can be joyous, it can be angry, it can be friendship, it can be love, it can be um, a critique, it can be factual. I don't know, that, that's just kind of broad. Whereas I try to reserve less emotion when I'm writing to external audiences because I sometimes don't know if, like I think of why I believe. I guess I got a big lesson in the last few years of trying to engage and be soft with folks who are engaging in racism, for example, and seeing that fundamentally they have different beliefs than I would in on that regard. And my emotions weren't being conveyed to them. And I was spending so much emotional energy hoping that maybe if they could see my pain, it might be different. And it took me a while to realize that it wasn't a problem of not even being able to con connect on empathy. It was a lack of care, period, and that I couldn't convince people to care for me just because I expressed my anguish or grief or sadness. Um, and that, it, in my experience, it just hasn't and wasn't going to happen. And I think for me, that was a big learning curve because I thought maybe if folks knew how much pain we were in, how much pain I was in, and my community was in, that perhaps their eyes would be open to or hearts would be open to that. And I kind of have to laugh at myself now for thinking that that was the core issue behind this um, because I don't feel like pain is enough to motivate change. It just creates little islands of, I don't know what to call it, but what they might call sympathy or empathy or, oh, that was so beautiful, it was amazing, and then go back to their life and nothing has changed. And so I tried mm. to um, just be a bit more frank in the writing that goes outside of that or not that goes that's meant for places outside because I want to save the emotions and care I do have for the for BIPOC communities and my own community um and outside of that I won't put the same passion and energy into it anymore yeah mm. That really, really resonates with me. Jess, do you feel um, like a, a similar pressure to represent yourself in a particular way um, mm. to a particular audience? Mm. I was thinking about this and I the only audience that I care about is my community. <laughs> And and I understand that like, you know, a, a writer speaks to outside of that experience, but and and or outside of himself. And and I am really grateful if anyone reads my work, but um and and the thought that it could like have an impression on someone is kind of remarkable to me. But it's the feedback from my community that actually like affects me and makes me want to write or makes me or or gives me drive. Um and I, I know a lot of I know a lot of folk like feel pressure to to write to the label that they've been given, or that's a, a, a critique I hear or a, or a pain that I hear a lot. Like you know, having to be the Aboriginal writer or having to be the queer writer. Um, but I don't write well if if I'm thinking about that stuff. I think. I, like it needs to come from a different place and a p place of like love or anger is usually generative <laughs> for me um, and trying to, yeah, remove, remove, 
non-Indigenous, non-queer or, or whichever community, like the communities that I am a part of, like trying to remove those outside eyes from that writing. Mm-hmm. What you were saying, Victoria, about like reserving your energy for your community, um, that's that's generative and that's rich and that's how I, f- I feel like mm-hmm. we have power to come together. Mm-hmm. Um Alison, how does how does your writing resist the colony to come back to what's on the box? <laughs> you can't moderate and like I can't moderate my way out. Of it. <laughs> <laughs> I was so close. Um, I've been having maybe similar conundrums to what you've both been expressing about like the capacity, especially for um, bearing in poetry. I think is especially easy to slip into this, just bearing your pain as if. Um, your your complaints or the pain that you're articulating will mm. go away um, as long as the source of the pain realises, as if um, mm. kind of what you'd experienced was an accident and if you published a book about how bad it was, um, then certainly the colony is just going to be like, you're right, and just up and disappear. Mm. Um, <laughs> and it's really, really easy to, to fall into that, I think, um, and to at the same time the way that the publishing industry is structured when you publish work unless you're very mindful or unless you limit it to a particular performance mm-hmm. or a context um, you're inevitably going to attract an audience that might want to see that from you and mm-hmm. so it's so difficult um, coming back to what you've both said earlier that the audience has control over the work in effect once mm-hmm. you kind of render it out so how do you protect it from the meaning that they want to get from you um, is something mm. that I find really difficult. Um, and so I guess while I'd previously say, you know, of course my writing is resisting, it's like talking back, it's like getting angry, it's providing testimony, um, to what extent can these structures just absorb that as part of their everyday business and have writers' festivals where people go home and think, oh, that sucked, and then that's the end of their engagement. Mm. Um, So, yeah, it's been really, really nice to hear that coming from both of you, although I recognise this is not an experience we all enjoy (laughs) being perceived Mm. in this way and being pressured in this way. Mm. That um that sort of deficit model that you were talking about before, Victoria, like that desire of the sort of colonial structure to see like the the non-white other as like somehow suffering or in pain or like mm. not not worth celebrating is something that I mm. find really like I do think about that element of the white gaze because there are things that mm-hmm. I don't want to talk about in my writing that can be you like that, that is raw and true and real but that is private business like mm-hmm. for a community to talk about mm-hmm. and I don't want being read by audiences outside of that space but mm-hmm. there's a tension there right where it's like you want to keep those things safe but I think those Mm -hmm. conversations are also important and so having spaces where like people of colour can come together and and Mm -hmm. write and speak for one another I think is really powerful and important and one of the things that I'm like really relieved by with this sort of digital space that we're now living in that we can sort of connect across all the various countries of this continent and the countries of this like planet um Mm. to come together as like a an indigenous a global indigenous um writing space and reading space and thinking space I wonder if we could maybe explore that idea a bit more like what does it mean to have a relationship between all these different First Nations people through writing, what does that mean for you? Um, I think I've tapped in on it a little bit earlier when I said that we all have a shared experience because we all face oppression from the systems, but then how that experience manifests is unique to each individual, each community, each nation. And I think I find myself so comforted when I'm amongst BIPOC people because 
what I what I hear all three of us say is that we're doing mental gymnastics. Like we don't get to just write a poem about our pain. We have to think about who's viewing it, what their intentions behind viewing it, how it would be read, how we will feel about their perception of the way they read it. So that even if we put it out there, if it makes us feel worse putting it out there, that's something we have to consider. Mm -hmm. And then so it's like huge, it's like mental Olympics. And we're constantly battling that every time we walk through life. And I feel like maybe someone's the high jump, someone's the relay race, someone's the, I don't know, some other track and field sport, um, the hurdle. <laughs> so, um, but we can all come together and talk about that and talk about what it is to our collective psyche, to our individual bodies, to our, to our minds, and have that shared chatter even though our experiences are all very unique and I find that so comforting and so beautiful because then I gain so much from learning from how others resist because everyone's experiencing different things. Um, I get to think about my own experience in a new way. And it's not that, it's not consuming my experience when I tell someone who's had a different but shared experience because I'm no longer sharing it as something to be consumed. I'm sharing it in solidarity. And mm -hmm. for me, it's healing and really powerful. And also, there's just a different level of baseline trust when I walk into a room full of BIPOC people. I just immediately feel a little more comfortable than when I, if I were to walk into a room full of white people, even if they were really beautiful people. I just don't have that immediate trust in sussing everyone out waiting for them to say something racist i'm waiting for them to say something that um exerts their power over me or i'm defensive waiting for my power to be challenged and me trying to defend it whereas i just don't feel that particularly with um in a space of bipoc fans mm -hmm. um it just feels like so much is lifted in those spaces and i feel so comfortable and it's healing even if what we talk about is very heavy and real and well. I, I feel like there is this sort of myth that I hear being expounded by folk, by by non-Indigenous folk and, and, not, and people who aren't of colour that like I feel like there's this desire for the settler experience to equate the migrant experience and I find that really interesting because there's so much that aligns with, you know, the... the migrant in Australia who has been displaced from their homeland, right? Mm. And as like a, displacement is a, is a huge theme throughout the First Nations experience of this country and so many folk being, you know, forced off their homelands for whatever reason. Um, and I feel like the colonial project, like we are all victims of the colonial project in that, in that metric, right? And so the ways that we kind of come back together, I think, are really healing and beautiful and mm -hmm. the ways that we can kind of find those solidarities between our different communities is so generative, um, mm -hmm. which, like, of course, isn't to say, like, that all settler folk are wicked and whatever, but um, there, I think, is there is an inherent similarity between the migrant and first nations experience or the recent displaced migrant experience that is really different from the like european settler who has been mm. living on this land for a number of generations and have extracted mm. the wealth of this land in an inherited and unquestioning way mm. um and i think it's really beautiful that we can come together and challenge that mm. Mm. Are there any mob writing internationally between um, the First Nations and the recently displaced migrant experience that either of you draw inspiration from? I'm thinking of um, mob overseas who have really challenged me in the way that I write, the work of Billy Ray Belcourt, uh, Aboriginal queer poet from Canada, um, has really kind of driven, um, in a sense, my ideas of um, what we can share in terms of a common experience but also what distinguishes us and how we express that without um, in some way implying that um, our experiences are better or worse 
I'm just accepting mm. that's what they are. Um, but do either of you have authors that you turn to when you want to explore these relationships? I have a visual cue, just one sec. Oh, my God, okay. You've been waiting for this moment. No, I haven't. I just I just recently bought this book and it's been next to my bedside table. Um, so it's called When the Light of the World Was Subdued, Our Songs Came Through. Stunning. Okay. Um, which was edited by Joy Harjo, and it's a like a big an, um, anthology of First Nations Native American writing. Um, and yay, I got to pull it off the bedside table. The the perks of being <laughs> recording from the bedroom, um, which I didn't buy because there was someone in there that I like, you know, and am mad for. But I was just I, I love what. Joy is doing in that space in, you know, Turtle Island, Americas, and and I think, um, I'm I'm always really like thrilled when I read First Nations writing from across the planet, and and I see those similarities and those threads in experience despite like the gulf of distance. Um, I remember the first time I read Eduardo C. Corral's um, collection, I was just like, how is it that this queer man on the other side of the planet can describe things that I have felt with images that I have never seen you know like Mm -hmm. he his writing is so grounded in place and in his own lands um and yet it it transcends that which ah that's the joy of poetry baby (laughs) (laughs) Um, and what about you, Victoria? Do any books kind of speak to you in the same way or offer you that same kind of solace? Yeah, um, likewise there is this book I have. It's not quite on my bedside, but it's like just there. But it'll oh, be no. Cool. <laughs> but I really, I, I'm going to get it actually. Okay. <laughs> Look what you've done, Jazz. I know, visual <laughs> cues. It's, I can't help myself. <laughs> This is amazing. I know we have some capacity to cut and edit, so I feel like <laughs> um, these two books are a big solace for me. So this one is by Charmaine Pippetop Green, and it's called False Claims of Colonial Thieves, and also John Kinsella. I think that's how it's just name. This book is really beautiful and provides me a lot of comfort. And it's really nice to have that and to have heard a little bit of it live. And this one I just got after waiting for it for nine months. It's called It Ain't Over Until We're Smoking Cigars on the Drill Pad. And it's by Mark Tilson. He's a poet um, and a person that was on the front lines of Standing Rock. He's Ovella Lakota. And I just love his work. And it's been really reaching the depths of my soul lately. And I'm so thankful for it because I've been going through a very hard time and I feel like it's kept my head above water. Both of the books are really special, but this one in particular just really, really speaks to my heart. Um, so definitely those. And yeah, I guess similarities of how can this person express things that I've felt with such realness and such accuracy that it kind of creeps me out. I'm like, whoa, how do you know me? <laughs> Um, and really beautiful that we have that shared experience that I haven't been able to find across poetry that's not from mm. conversation. I appreciate, again, this is a bit of a curveball question and I didn't put it in the thing, and I'm just inviting you to wildly speculate here. Um, but do you think it's a coincidence that these texts that we're talking about and that all three of us are poets? Is there something about poetry that is good at speaking back? Um, and speaking to one another in this way? I think that I was thinking about this recently because I was trying to think about the way that coding and poetry have a relationship to each other, which mm-hmm. is to say that I think a sim- a, something can be deceptively simple um, and I feel like poetry can has the power to, you know, it. I don't want to use bullets as a metaphor because it's so violent, but like the power of those words to sort of cut through, um, cut through the 
face of what's been going on. I'm mixing my metaphors like maniac. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it, it's incisive and it's powerful and, and there is something about the way that it challenges like English language standard forms. So mm. it, in its very like construct, it, it is protest as well. I mean, I don't know about you guys, I don't write in rhyming couplets in the style of like the great British poets um, and being able to kind of pull apart the thing that is poetry for our own causes I think is really joyous. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, for me, I don't think it's a coincidence at all. I think poetry, it's a form of art that, and all art is creative expression, but then we're using such an analytical tool, um, words to try to create images and feelings. And I feel that switch between the multiple uses of the brain really is a transformative process. Um, yeah, it's not a coincidence at all. And I think it's such a beautiful experience of solidarity. I just feel like it's slipping away and I want to capture it back. So I want to go back two questions now. So I guess the experiences of solidarity across being BIPOC and like across BIPOC communities and different First Nations communities and people who are displaced not by choice and migrate to Australia versus settlers. Mm -hmm. I just want to speak as someone who's a settler migrant here is that I would identify myself as a settler migrant in this country, when I went to um, so-called Canada, I was a refugee, and so it's a little bit different. Here, I had the means and the privilege to travel here on my own. And I do feel like there's still a lot of assimilation that is sometimes forced, sometimes optional, sometimes complicated, sometimes a wider range of things, but I feel a little bit nervous about saying this but I don't always feel like we can homogenize BIPOC either um, even as a solidarity statement because so much oppression towards First Nations people in so-called Australia happens also from the called community and I just want to acknowledge that and highlight that that it's beautiful the idea of all of us being in solidarity but anti-blackness is so prevalent and the way I see folks um, get privileged or not privileged because of that and then on top of that how that relationship is to First Nations people so I'm speaking of anti-blackness in called communities and then how that plays out and how folks interact with and occupy the land and step into colonial spaces when they don't have to with so much glee and take that power away from the people whose land they're on um, mm. don't do anything to kind of mitigate power structures or yeah I guess there's a lot of people in a wide variety of communities who are doing amazing resistance and solidarity work but I think there's a greater amount who are happy to talk about their experiences of racism but will then do nothing to critique their own place as non-First Nations people in this country and do nothing to truly step up with and show up for um, folks here. And I feel like, I don't know, it's just not uneasy to not state that as someone who's not First Nations to this country, knowing how harmful migrant communities have been after settler communities. So it's like, yeah, I'd, again, I don't want to say anyone's experience is better or worse, but I think it would not be fair to not name that because there's so much violence that does go on um, in that space. Sorry, I just felt like highlighting that very quickly. Mm. No, you absolutely don't have to apologise um, and I'm glad we took the time to talk over those relationships maybe a bit more closely. Um, Jess, did you want to respond before I did? Oh, no, I just appreciate your care in that response and, and going back to that point. Um, I guess, yeah, like you said, there is no homogenous experience um, and... I'm, yeah, I, I, as a First Nations person, I, I, I recognise that our experience of being on in this land is, is a unique one to everyone mm -hmm. who has arrived over the last 250 years. Um, mm -hmm. 
but also that the systems in place in this country create suffering from for people outside of our community as well and and it is a it is a vindictive colony against people that don't uh present the way that the colony demands mm. what about you Alison there is nothing more to say you both covered it I mean white supremacy is a structure that is supported um by anti-blackness by the displacement of mob um, and also by the cruelty towards recently displaced migrants. It's mm. structurally relying on all of us to only tackle, I guess, like one pillar at a time. And so that's why that solidarity is so crucial, I think. Um, and it's exciting for me to be able to see First Nations writers coming through who are writing to that as well and being able to unpack the nuances in the way that you have, Jazz. And it's also fantastic to see Cold and Pock and Black Indigenous, well, no, I suppose not Indigenous, people of colour who are writing on this continent to also think critically about their place here. Um, and I think this is a, a conversation that we're going to see a lot more over the next 10 or so years. And hopefully it's going to be led by you two. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Great um, pressure. Alison, I wanted to ask you a question um, sure. kind of on the topic of writing, po writing protest and also the way that is received um, by various groups. Um, the collection, the brilliant collection that you edited earlier this year, Firefront, with um, UQP that brought together like over 50 different Indigenous writers and beautiful essays. Um, I was really struck by the different ways that that collection was received in different reviews that I read. Um, <laughs> and I, I wondered one. if you could speak <laughs> to the experience of bringing that together and like what... Um, what compelled you to bring together a collection of protest poetry specifically and then also the way that it sort of created its own thing to protest? <laughs> totally agree. Um, I'm just worried that Rayleigh's in the chat telling us to wrap up, so I'll be really, really quick, I promise. Okay. Um, but but Firefront was a, a collection, is a collection of, like, First Nations poetry that has been published in some way, shape or form. Uh, and it wasn't my intention to pull together protest poetry specifically, but each poem that was in there worked towards, um, I suppose, um, a protest purpose, if that makes sense. Each one was crafted mm -hmm. even just by virtue of using and turning around the English language in response in some way to the colony. Um, and so that was kind of in the introduction and we received, we received, the, the collection received uh, reviews that um, suggested that maybe its protest nature meant that it was um, perhaps less good in the form of poetry as an execution of the form of poetry, mm -hmm. um, even though the collection contained um, profoundly experimental, delightful, mm -hmm. adept, um, expert, like, practice mm -hmm. of the use of verse. Um, so that was frustrating to see that reaction, comma, mm -hmm. at the same time that was the exact reaction that Woodrow Nunicol faced when she mm -hmm. began to publish her poetry. Um, so in some ways it's good that there's a complaint that the protest poetry is too rowdy. That means that we're getting across. In a long tradition of being, uh, of ruffling the feathers of people who are going to decide how you could display your dis distaste. That's it. <laughs> if we can get the same reaction um, that faced the, the woman who didn't start this all but certainly kind of created this intergenerational foundation from which we can move. If we keep getting the same reaction as her, then we're doing something right. Um, <laughs> um, on that note, just with Rayleigh in the chat, I can feel your kind of omnipresent pressure egging us on. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Jazz and Victoria. This has been a really, really exciting conversation um, that I should note doesn't have to end here. I think um, all of us here are really, really interested in continuing this conversation uh, across all of the literary spaces um, 
especially those that we can reserve for complex conversations between ourselves as Black and Indigenous people of colour. So thank you so it. much, Alison, and thank right. you, National Young Writers Festival. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate both of your presences. Thank you, Victoria. Mandangu. Thank you, Victoria.